So, with some unity in place, let's take a look at how this civilization was created. As you can see here Asia is divided up into multiple countries. China is the largest, but there are millions of other people living in Asia, that are not Chinese. Japan, which we'll be talking about later, is on its own island separated from the rest. So, it should be obvious now, since geography proves it easily. Chinese and Japanese people are not the same and neither are the people from the other Asian cultures. They have unique traditions, languages, and homelands. Asia and the Pacific region make up about a third of the world's total land area. Asia, the largest continent, stretches all the way from the Pacific Ocean to Europe and from the Arctic Circle to the equator. Here you'll find some of Earth's most dramatic examples of seismic activity. Volcanoes produce the islands that run from Asia's Pacific coast to the Indian Ocean. while the collision of tectonic plates raised the world's highest mountains, the mighty Himalaya. Europe and Asia occupy the same landmass, but they are considered separate continents. Asia begins at the Ural Mountains and Caspian Sea. Now, let's take a look at technology. Ah, the Silk Road. You've heard about this before. Remember the Renaissance? The Silk Road is the trade route running from Asia to Europe. It crosses mountains and deserts, and is quite an adventure. China really didn't use the road much themselves. They let the Europeans come to them. Truth is, China didn't really like any foreign people, and didn't want them around. For a while, remember, they even closed off the Silk Road. The trade that did happen though helped to spread Chinese ideas to the world. Ten years later, an old man appeared in Wu Di's court. Zhang Qian, the faithful diplomat, had survived. The courageous servant recounted his ten-year odyssey, including a startling discovery he'd made in his travels. Zhang Chen had escaped his captors and fled as far west as Afghanistan. There, to his amazement, he found Chinese goods on sale in every marketplace. Traders were moving Chinese products to the edge of the known world. The most precious commodity, a cloth called silk. Wu Di listened in disbelief as Zhang Chen described how Chinese merchandise was transported along a network of rough trails called the Silk Road. Running across China, through Persia, to the Mediterranean, the trade route covered some 4,000 miles. Bales of the finest Chinese silk were being traded on the streets of Imperial Rome. In fact, Romans bought the material in such abundance that the Emperor Tiberius imposed a limit on imported silk garments. Silk is still one of China's most famous export products. But during Roman times, the secret of its production was totally exclusive to China. If wealthy Romans wished to adorn themselves with this wonderful material, they would have to buy it. And they did. For this reason, a great trade route became established in the first century BC. Beginning around the Yellow River, this overland highway stretched all the way across Asia to the Mediterranean lands controlled by the Romans. The 7,000 miles of route became known after the Chinese commodity that the Romans were so keen to obtain, the Silk Road. Relatively few pieces of silk actually made the straight journey all the way from China to Rome. The middlemen in Persia and in India formed on their own a very important part of the silk trade and that kept a lot of the demand for luxuries going during the early periods 
of the first and second centuries AD. The spread of ideas like Buddhism, which came from India to China via some of those silk routes, shows the intellectual and social importance of the route, as well as its key nature as a trade route. It was one of the few ways in which China did communicate with other major cultures across that Silk Road. Generally, China has not been interested in international trade or indeed any kind of commerce or intercourse with non-Chinese peoples. It was only when the West kind of forced itself on China that China begins to open up to Western influences. China didn't want that and tried not to have it. And so Chinese foreign policy has generally been a policy trying to keep people out and keep the Chinese in, not to trade, not to have diplomatic relations, and generally speaking, to remain isolated. It was forced out of that position when the West, with its great mobility, the advances in shipping in particular, and the advances in weaponry, was able to force China to ch change its stance. The Silk Road was the most exotic trade route ever built. For centuries, caravans brought precious metals and gemstones from the West in exchange for the Eastern Silk. Along the way, these products would pass through mountains, plains, deserts and fabulous cities. Tashkent and Samarkand, Damascus and Baghdad, Alexandria and Antioch. All along the Silk Road, Merchant middlemen were the real driving force. Typically, a Chinese trader would sell his fabrics to a trader in India, who would then journey west to trade with the Roman merchants of the Eastern Mediterranean. Roman money underwrote the whole business, and after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, trade dwindled for a while. But trade along its route did increase again, and continued well into the second millennium AD. Let's take a look at some of those ideas by examining Chinese society. China, throughout its history, has primarily been guided by three philosophies. They are basically religions, but don't always involve a god. Instead we look at these as ways of thinking about the world. We look at Buddhism first as it was dominant during most of the time period we cover. Buddhism did not start in China. It was originally created in India, but was brought over. There's also a Simpsons episode all about it. It is pretty funny. The main teaching of Buddhism is desire as the root of unhappiness. Basically, when you want stuff that makes you sad. Think about it, it is totally true. Like at Christmas, if you get tons of gifts, but not the one you really wanted you get all bummed out. Kind of weird, huh? Buddhism also teaches that suffering happens to everyone so just accept it. You can't change it so why try? Lastly, Buddhism is about respect for all life. People, animals, trees, everything. Buddhists believe all life has a soul, so it should be treated well. Building on this idea of respect for all is Taoism. It was focused heavily on nature. Hi, Lisa. Hey, Ralph. Hi, Lisa. Hey, gang. Okay, Bart, this is the card catalog. Let's see. Golf. Anecdotes. Eisenhower and fashion, humor, Japanese obsession with. Ah, here it is. Putting. And finally, the most important book of all, The Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Lisa, we can't afford all these books. Bart, we're just gonna borrow them. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. I want you to shut off the logical part of your mind. Okay. Embrace nothingness. You got it. Become like an uncarved stone. Done. Bart, you're just pretending to know what I'm talking about. True. Well, it's very frustrating. I'll bet. Bart, I have a riddle for you. What's the sound of one hand clapping? Piece of cake. No, Bart, it's a 3,000-year-old riddle with no answer. It's supposed to clear your mind of conscious thought. No answer? Lisa, listen up. Ugh, let's try another one. If a tree falls in the woods and no one's around, does it make a sound? Absolutely. <coughs> But Bart, how can sound exist if there's no one there to hear it? Ooh. 